Good afternoon. I am Kelly Brown Douglas, Dean of the Episcopal Divinity School at Union Theological Seminary here in New York City. Thank you for joining us for another in our series of Just Conversations, where we engage issues of racialized inequities intrinsic to our nation, as well as our collective responsibility to create a more just future. Today's Just Conversation is another in a series of conversations with members of a cohort of 12 scholars, faith leaders, artists, and activists who have come together in a project sponsored by the Henry Luce Foundation to reflect on religion and racial justice, expanding the immoral imaginary through film, and to share their research and their work. It is such a privilege and a pleasure to welcome to this conversation today two of our cohort members. Savannah Wood, who's an artist who works primarily in photography, text, and installation to explore how spirituality, domesticity, and our relationships to place shape our identities. She also serves as the executive director of Afro Charities, where she is creating an infrastructure to increase access to the nearly 130-year-old Afro-American newspaper's extensive archives. I also welcome the Reverend Dr. Starsky Wilson, president and CEO of the Children's Defense Fund and Children's Defense Action Council. Prior to coming to the Children's Defense Fund, he pastored St. John's Church, the beloved community, a multiracial congregation in St. Louis, where his church hosted the Black Lives Matter Freedom Ride to Ferguson and other mobilizations. He was subsequently appointed as co-chair of the Ferguson Commission, which released the Forward Through Ferguson, a path toward racial equity. Thank you both for joining me today in this conversation. There is so much to talk about, so I want to jump right in. Savannah, I was struck by one of the projects of Afro Charities called Rereading the News. Given the news coming out of Memphis regarding the vicious murder of Tyree Nichols, do we or how can we reread the news, particularly for our children? And I ask this both of you and Starsky, particularly Starsky, given your work with the Children's Defense Fund. How do we, what do we do? How do we reread the news? Thank you for having me. Um, so rereading the news is the program that we do that primarily looks at the history in the Afro archives. So looking at articles from a long time ago and bringing that history into the present, um, having conversations with people to unpack what's in that article and how it relates to the present. Um, obviously, with the news of this yet another um, state-sanctioned murder <laughs> of another Black person, um, it is at once very present, very contemporary, and incredibly historical, you know, and so when we're thinking about um, this enduring legacy in the United States of anti-Black violence, particularly at the hands of the state, there is a, it's necessary to really frame it within a context that is larger than each individual case. Obviously, when you right. take it to court, you've got to do one case at a time. But when we're talking about it, we're trying to understand what has happened here. This is a history that's been going on for the entire time that we've been in this country. So, you know, it's really a question that is much larger about who we are as a country and um, whether or not people are willing to be honest about the fact that we have not actually evolved as much as people say we have. On our day to day, in many ways, the, the way that the thing that is different is that not everybody is subject to this all at the same time, perhaps but that we're still dealing with such incredible um, violence from the state. And so I think in terms of how do we frame this for our children, I think you know, it's incredibly difficult to talk about such things that are so deeply harmful and painful um, with young people who are, have such an innocence and um, a joy. No, that's right. But it's I, also I, the reality yeah. of where we are. So, you know, um, I think I think there are we are we have to talk about 
the wider arc of history when we talk about um, instances like this that are just so horrific and at once also so every day. Yeah, no, I so appreciate that historical uh, context. And I want to get back to that. But Starsky, you're working uh, with children and you that's what the Children's Defense Fund is sort of all about, uh, uh, nurturing and fostering healthy uh, lives for our children. What? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate Savannah's point. And, and again, thank you, uh, Dean, for having uh, me to join this conversation. Um, because I think it ties together two events, right? So we we have this conversation um, the Monday following the release of the Tyree Nichols um, uh, video um, uh, of his murder at the hands of the state. Um, and uh, we do so uh, just a week removed from responses to um, Governor uh, Ron DeSantis yeah. Uh, action um, to call African-American history not history, uh, would have his education department to say that it didn't have significant educational relevance, uh, speaking against the college board's uh, AP uh, African-American history course. Um, and so I think these things, to, these things are tied together. Um, the need, uh, as Savannah notes, to put in context what happens in Memphis and what happened in Ferguson and what has happened all over this country uh, happens first uh, with our ability to wrestle with the reality uh, of uh, naming the history, the heritage, and cultural gifts and values uh, of Black people in this country. And so, so first, um, I have to affirm uh, and appreciate your question. You assume the sale. Um, you assume that we need to do it by asking how we do it. Uh, and, and, and I want to say, um, that we need to do it in every form and fashion that we can, including in the structures in our classrooms, right? This has to be a part of the curriculum that we pay for in public schools by virtue of our taxes. Uh, it has to be a part of how we experience um, silent, quiet moments in our homes uh, with our children, uh, being sure that we interrogate um, the bookshelves in our houses, uh, that we are spending time with giving culturally uh, and age appropriate exposure to young people of uh, some of these historic figures who wrestled with these challenges. And so uh, I joy in uh, reading uh, to my daughter um, who's seven years old uh, about um, uh, about his, about Claudette Colvin. Uh, mm -hmm. I joy in um, talking with her uh, and reading books about Misty Copeland and, and, and these affirmations of both the beauty and brilliance of Blackness on a continuum for her help her to, to, to shore up uh, the kind of sense of self-agency uh, and, um, and confidence that when something like this happens, as it inevitably will, then it at least has to, it has to run up against what we have poured into her by showing her these powerful figures of the past uh, that she looks like, that she um, uh, that she can approximate. And that's really what we're trying to do in Freedom Schools with the Children's Defense Fund across the country. We're trying to show young people themselves in books because they don't see themselves in textbooks from Texas, which is where I'm from. And a lot of our textbooks come out of Texas. Um, we try to talk to them about their agency uh, in civic life, the civics education is being pulled out, uh, and we're trying to teach them their history um, so that they have the kind of self-confidence that I talk about with my baby girl. Um, these are things that we've got to do in these structures and systems, but we also have to do it in our home. Yeah, so I, and, and Savannah, I see you shaking your head so you can uh, jump in. So listen, yes, uh, uh, you're right. There has to be some kind of inter intervention. So but I, I am struck by, as you say that, and I'll get to another side of that in a moment. Uh, uh, I'm struck by the fact that we are talking about interventions and how, in fact, you know, historically, the Black church and other sort of independent Black institutions have been the ones that have had to fill in the gaps here, right? Yeah. Uh, to where our school systems don't. I'm also struck by the way in which you talk about conversations that have to go on. What we're recognizing, perhaps, is conversations that aren't going on, not in, for instance, 
uh, non-black households, households where aren't people of color. I'm, I was at a school uh, last week and a little uh, middle schooler called another black uh, student a monkey. Several, a middle schooler made this connection between blackness and monkey. Several things had to happen or not happen for that to occur. What, what becomes not simply the role of uh, the Black church, but Black artists, right? Uh, uh, in Black newspapers, the Black press, in helping to make these interventions, not simply within, uh, for children of color, but in the, in the wider community as well. I think we see it, we're seeing a lot more of it all the time. I mean, I, you know, so much of this backlash against what is called critical race theory, but is actually just regular history came yeah. about because <laughs> exactly. of um, Nicole Hannah Jones's 1619 project. I mean, that was a real catalyst for people who are afraid of us actually knowing what happened <laughs> right. and what continues to happen and to understand how this is a continuum that was a real catalyst for people to start cracking down on uh, what's being taught in schools on a very basic level i mean we're talking about you know ron DeSantis, but there's also you know we just had mlk day and right. i was reminded by um dr yaba blay through a speech that she gave at the university of virginia that was fiery and fantastic, um, you know, that all of these people who are, you know, cracking down on CRT were also praising um, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Right. on his nationally recognized holiday. And so I think what we just, we see, uh, and she, what she said also was that at the time of his assassination, his approval rating was abysmally low among exactly. white people, but also fairly low, I would say, among black people. And That's so right. for anybody to be saying in 2023 that they are a supporter of his thoughts and his processes, likely many of these people who were writing these things would have been, you know, rallying and in support of um, his assassination, in fact. And even the FBI tweeted out, happy MLK day, you know, so we're experiencing <laughs> gaslighting on a national level where they're saying, we value you, you're, you're great. And meanwhile, we're being murdered in the streets. We're being told that our history doesn't matter. And right. so there is this movement, there always has been for the black press, for instance, to show up and to say, we actually know what's happening here. We know who right. we are. We're gonna speak to ourselves because we see the gaslighting that's happening in the white press and the ways that they're painting us and we know better. And in order for us to survive this, we have to say better. We have to build each other up. And, you know, hopefully y'all will learn also, but that's not actually even what this is about. First, it's about me focusing on my folks and making sure that we know who we are, where we came from, that our history doesn't begin in the United States also, but that the history that is in the United States is a very rich and complicated history of fighting for our right to do basic things, you know? Um, and how do we carry that forward? So I'm really encouraged by seeing projects like the 1619 Project, for instance, which is one of just a huge example coming out with a wide release in the way that it has. And the way that there are more and more projects like that, like Descendant on Netflix is another great film uh, okay. about a, a very complicated history that now we know a lot more about, or um, you know, the recent PBS doc on Zora Neale Hurston, all right. of these things, there's so much content that is now very widely available that starts to get at these deep legacies of um, bringing Black histories to the surface and making sure that our true humanity is, uh, our full humanity is really understood in a complex way. So I'm going to get to the streaming and stuff and, and start mm, yeah. out. <laughs> because I, I am, I do want, because you're right, I mean, 1619 just moved to H, uh, Hulu and all of this. Mm -hmm. And I want to get to the part of this film. But what, so we're talking about it on this positive sort of helping uh, Black people, Black children, as well as perhaps the wider com uh, community, but to be able to affirm themselves. One thing that we know is the depth of this anti-Black narrative, right? That also uh, where people instinctively see a Black body and oh, it's criminality or whatever, that it is also impacted as we can see. And we many of us have argued it, it impacts Black people too. And we see that particularly when they're in these systems, uh, that state systems that foster that. How, how, 
do we combat that? And I think I, you know, I'm looking at the art behind uh, Starsky as, as well as this one. What, what do we do? Is there a unique role? How do we combat that? Does just simply affirmation do that? How do we combat that narrative and make people even aware of it's, it's just because these were black men who committed this this particular hideous event doesn't negate uh, what's going on on a more systemic, structural, ideological kind of level. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. The we got to own that our identity is not our politics. Uh, and that being said, I mean, for me, it feels like what we need is an invitation, a call, a, a return to Blackness, how we choose to define such. Um, and this has to happen not just on platforms, but in communities and institutions. I am uh, I am both activist and institutionalist. Uh, I think we need some places uh, and some some structures to hold us together. Uh, and to protect us against some things. And so uh, for me, right, I've told people in a, in a group in, in Baltimore uh, at the end of the year, like I'm, I'm, I'm blackity black. I check all of the black boxes, all of the black institutions, right? The black family, um, a, a matrilineal, matriarchal, um, raised uh, in the black church. My mama was the uh, Sunday school teacher and a training union leader and a youth development before they had youth pastors. My mom was the youth director, right? It was always somebody, mama. Um, I went to an HBCU, I joined the black fraternity, a few of them, matter of fact, um, you know, got more, you know, as uh, Sam DeWitt Proctor said, we got enough handshakes to have the policy. Um, you know, all the grips, all these things served on the board of a black a newspaper, right? All of these things are critically important for us, not just for affirmation, but to have space outside of and away from white gaze. Uh, and so uh, so we need those in order to create and to imagine those things uh, that we desire for ourselves to be. And I think that kind of return, and I say this as a Gen Xer who was raised to code switch, I say this as someone who was taught um, that uh, my subjects, uh, uh, that, that I have to make uh, all of my uh, complete sentences and I have to wear uh, the certain kind of things in order to get along and navigate in this world. And that was a form for a moment that, frankly, I think even young people are calling us to come back from. Uh, we have to be able to be ourselves and not just as an assertion or an affirmation, um, but as resistance in and of itself. And, and for some of us, it would mean coming back from and unlearning things that we have been taught. Right. Um, meaning you know, just we're going to have to wrestle with some of the things that were just not helpful because this moment calls us to more or to say that I only got it in that moment. So my children don't have to deal with it. Um, and so and so it does mean surrounding ourselves with these things. And it means interrogating the approaches of our institutions. Right. Um, we have we have had institutions like. CDF or like NAACP or like the National Urban League to take approaches that are accommodationist approaches that that make incremental progress for us. And this moment calls for something else. We have staffed in ways on our boards and in our institutions that allow for us to seem enough of an accommodation list to be able to get a little bit done. And now it's time for us to go be blackity black because our people need such and we have concentrated by use of that, and for some of these institutions a century, by use of that, we have accumulated resources that our people need. And we have capacity to hit the ground for people who won't make the stream and don't have Netflix. We actually have to be in communities creating art at the church. We actually have to be in space and on the ground with folks who don't have that access, lest we leave Black po folks behind. Right. While black middle class folk get ahead, get along and accommodate the next wave. This weekend, I, I just leave it like this because I, you know, check all my boxes, right? Solidly middle class, all the things. <laughs> this weekend, while we were wrestling with the realities of Memphis, we we're also celebrating Founders Weekend and, and cutting the ribbon uh, at the DC headquarters of Jack and Jill, right? <laughs> Like these are, this is our reality, all of it. Right. And we got to figure out how we're going to throw in together. And the only institution I've seen hold us across those continuums is the Black church. And so I continue mm -hmm. to believe in the Black church and count on it uh, as, as part of our sociological salvation. But we need to be called back to that. Yeah. 
and 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 Starsky. I'm all those things. I'm Jack and Jill. So so I I yeah. I, I, right. I I feel you. Uh, to, though I didn't raise my son in Jack and Jill, but I'm I, I was uh, Jack and Jill from graduated out of it. Yeah, so, me so, too. so 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 that's those are the contradictions, and right. and that's this call of accountability. And Savannah, I look at you, and I'm going to get you all out of here on a last question after this. I look at you as this. I first became aware of Savannah Wood through your photography, uh, uh, and 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 so I look at look at you as this artist, and I've always thought of artists, be they uh, visual artists, photographers, that history of how they help to tell the story and give us access to who we were and all of us access that might not have access to some of these institutions that 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 Starsky's uh, speaking about. Where's it's not where is the 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 black artists of technology, but what how do we again return to uh, them being the sort of center of how we get to know about ourselves and and even the black press the role of the black press it seems as though that was so important and it's where is it now i mean i think i i think we lost a lot to integration actually um i talk about that quite a bit where there was a potency and an energy with everybody being in one place. Obviously we want equal access to things, but the strategies that we use to get that ended up kind of separating people out. So while the black church may remain a place where people mix between um, economic statuses, there are very few other spaces where that is the case. And mm -hmm. you know, one thing that was, I'll say a benefit of being mm -hmm. segregated was that everybody was at least in the same general area, you know? <laughs> But beyond that, you know, beyond that, I think um, one of the things that I think about a lot for your question about like, how do we combat some of these stories that are told about us? I honestly am not in that fight. I'm not in the fight of combating the story that's being told about me. If you want to tell that story, you have no interest in actually knowing who I am. So when um, I talk about like affirmation, my thought behind that is really it's about telling our own authentic stories in the way that we want to hear them and the way that we feel truly represents who we are. That's much more powerful to me than battling with somebody who has no interest in actually hearing me. So I, you know, there's a place for that for some artists, I'm sure. And, you know, even when I gave the examples of the streaming things that are on, you know, I, I would consider some of um, 1619 to be in direct opposition to some of those narratives that have been told, but it's also expanding a view in what Blackness actually is. And it's moving mm -hmm. in a direction that, to your point, Starsky, is more about our interiority and about like who we are when we're together, rather than it is about who we are when we have to fight against something outside of that. And I'm, I'm much more interested in that personally, is like, what happens when we are together? And, yeah. you know, and, and you know, who are we truly at our soul's core? And how do you let that piece of you shine so brightly that your humanity is like, it's undeniable. I mean, obviously it's undeniable no matter what, but um, you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying though? It's like, how, is the, how do we just let that essence be what speaks for us above everything else? I don't need to talk to people who don't, I, I'm not gonna convince you. Yep. Yep, You're, yep, yep. You insist on being wrong. There are hundreds of years of, you know, there's, I'm, I look at our archives, it's 130 years of That's information. Right. If you wanted to know something, you could find it, but right. you're actually actively trying to keep us from knowing that. Yeah. So what I'm going to focus on is making sure that the folks I love and care about know, and the ones who are curious can access the things that they actually want to know and need to know. And if y'all learn something, I'm really happy for you. I'm glad you finally showed up. But it's like, <laughs> but that's not where that's I'm not my role, <laughs> right? And not where I'm going to spend my energy. I, and 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 at the age that I am, I have said no, no more time. I've spent my energy doing that now. And I like this. Now it's about an interiority. I, I'm 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 done with that. So if you got it, you got it. If you didn't. So, which brings me to this last one. We're in a cohort about film <laughs> and expanding the moral imaginary. We have these wonderful conversations about these very various films that we're seeing with uh, a diverse group of persons of, of color. Uh, and so, you know, when we look at, if we just look at sort of films now on African-American uh, folks from 
Till and, and movies of our trauma uh, to uh, Afrofuturistic uh, films uh, like Wakanda Forever. Uh, where, what is, you know, what are your feelings and sense of rep film and the representation in terms of who we are and, and what these films are, are doing now? We know right after George Floyd, all of these films. Uh, that really just rehearsed our trauma uh, came out. Um, so, so what are where? What's the role, and how? What do you? What are your sense and your feeling of of film and representation, particularly as we look at uh, black bodies in our story? Yeah, I want to. I want to appreciate uh, film as an opportunity for us to connect. Uh, one of the things I appreciate about this cohort. Um, that it has given me back as a space of people to engage with and dialogue about um, the thing, right? Whether it's the <laughs> film, a book, you know, that's that's how these things come up for me. And so I recall um, the first Black Panther, I was pastoring at the time and, and gathering a full buyout with a couple of sister churches and, you know, full guard going to the theater. And so that kind of communi uh, uh, community community a connection, um, the invitation, the celebration of identity uh, as part of what uh, these films give us. Um, and so I appreciate the opportunity to engage in that way in order um, to open my own mind. I, in this cohort, this is the other thing. So to people who don't know this cohort, you listen to this series, you get to meet people. I'm the least artist in this cohort. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm mostly like ear hustling because I realize I need to surround myself with uh, black beauty and art, mostly, uh, uh, mostly, frankly, an agitation from my 14 year old son, who is an artist, uh, who I don't understand, but I like, like sit and have him explain stuff to me that he's doing self taught. Um, so I think there is there is the there's the opening to beauty, uh, when we have the opportunity to sit with art, uh, in this case, movies and film. Um, and there's also opportunity for agitation. Right. So I like listening to people talk about what we've, we've experienced then because there's stuff that I miss and I need to go back um, that I pick up again, the communality of it. Um, so it's a gift, um, both an agitation and an invitation to be in community, um, but the chance to sit in awe and wonder as well of the beauty of what's being presented. And I think we need that. Don't have I don't have enough of. It. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Um, I would say if you're the least artistic, maybe I'm the least in the religion camp, but I like, but I'm, <laughs> I'm really, <laughs> but I'm really curious about all of the different ways that that word can be expanded and all the different mm -hmm. ideas that people have been bringing to um, the conversation um, uh, from that lens. I would also say, you know, I think um, film is really special as just a format that um, incorporates so many different elements um, that can help people. So if it's a more um, educational film, it's like a, another form for folks who maybe are not really into reading, that they can get an essence of an idea or have a visceral experience of something that happened, particularly if the film is responsibly made and actually, you know, accurately depicts what happened, which is, you know, it's hard to do in a, in a limited time frame. But I'm also really um, interested in the imaginary as a space for um, creation, you know, and a, a place where we can imagine who we might be with in different contexts or um, one of the films that we watched together was everywhere, everything everywhere all at once, you know, and so that's like a great example of like, you know, just what, what, who could you be if you were unencumbered by these different yeah. elements or if something, these five things had shifted in your life and you know, imagining how you can bring some of that energy back into your lived experience and say, okay, so what kind of choices am I making now based on where I would like to be and like what I want, how I want this path to diverge moving into the future. So having the space for um, imagination um, and communication about that is really beneficial just for, you know, opening our perspectives to how we, how we move on the day to day. Well, there's so much that we could keep talking about. And for those of you listening in, can you imagine a group of 12 uh, people of color from various uh, uh, realities uh, and various faith traditions and various ethnicities uh, trying to 
uh, work together to expand our uh, moral imaginaries and to try to work together to figure out the work that we can do uh, to, to make a difference. Savannah and Starsky, thank you for this conversation. Thank you for your work uh, and your witness. Uh, and thank you all for joining us. And I hope this only begins to invite you in to more conversations and conversations between yourselves on ways in which we can begin and you can begin to move the needle forward uh, toward a more just future. Thank you both. Thank you all. Thank you. Blessings. Thanks, Tim.